Okay, so a little bit of backstory here, in case anybody has forgotten the Madagascar franchise. And I do mean franchise, because this thing has not just the original 2005 animated classic film about zoo animals getting stranded on an island and reverting to their natural selves, leading to some conflict, but also character development as well. But also, Madagascar escaped to Africa, from that fun time period when we put the number of the film into the title in some way. And Madagascar 3, Europe's Most Wanted. Now, that is not where this story ends, not even close, as there is also another film that of Penguins of Madagascar from 2014, which featured the frankly scarily dominant side characters of the Penguins, Skipper, Rico, Kowalski, and Private, who are in some ways the main antagonists for all events that happen in this franchise. but are also really, really funny in their hyper-organized, militaristic fashion. Scarily funny sometimes, especially Rico. Is he ever going to say anything? <laughs> but this Penguins of Madagascar isn't what we are talking about. That's a film. We're instead talking about the Penguins of Madagascar series that came before the film and was released around the same time that the second film came out, and ran for three seasons over 150 episodes between 2008 and 2015. That's where our focus is today, but it's not where the Madagascar story ended, as they also had the other spin-off series, All Hail King Julian which ran for six seasons across 2014 to 2017, and Madagascar A Little Wild in 2020, the prequel to the original film and a spin-off that finally featured the main freaking characters of the film rather than the side ones that must have just done better numbers with the testing audiences they use. I like to move it, move it. I like to move it, move it. I like to... Why did I bring all of this up? Because it came up in my research, honestly, and I just wanted you people to realise how off the rails almost every animated franchise that does well and has interesting or likeable or just plain appealing to children's side characters ends up becoming. Seriously, check out the extended Shrek franchise sometime. Shrek in the Swamp Karaoke Dance Party is something that did not need to get made and yet is a real pinnacle of that time period. Wilderness. Big butts and I cannot lie. Why and see ya. Staying alive. Staying alive. And this tangent quite nicely brings me to the important announcement that this dive into a random animated spin-off show's trans-ish episode is brought to you by a sponsor, specifically the Galaxy Projector, created by Galaxy Lamps, because when you have a signature product and style, it makes sense to brand everything like that. Trust me, I know. And for this Cyber Monday season, that event after Black Friday when tech products feel left out, if you have ever wanted to light up a room like the starry night sky that our ancestors used to look up at and dream of what wonders might lay out there, then this is the perfect product for you. It literally turns whatever room you set it up in into a miniature version of a planetarium, with all the minutiae and excitement that exist within the void beyond our own atmosphere. The sale is currently on right now, the Cyber Monday sale that I mentioned just beforehand. And if you want a fun and funky experience like this, all controlled by an app that you can download to have whatever colours, 
brightness, speed, and timers that suit your preferences to match whatever mood you might be in at the time, including doing it via Alexa or Google Assistant to control the mini galaxy you've created with your own voice, like you are trying to emulate the gods themselves, then your best bet is checking out the link in the description and finding the very nicely discounted product that does all of this, the Galaxy Projector. Oh, it's also energy efficient too, using as little power as possible to do all this really cool stuff. The magic of light emitting diodes at work right there. At the end of the day, if you want a product that creates an awesome light show in whatever space you put it in, then the Galaxy Projector does just that. It works very well and it's reliable. What more praise can I really give to it that would appeal to you? So check out the link below and get your own Galaxy Projector today in the biggest Cyber Monday sale that Galaxy Lamps has had so far. Now that my own personal tangent and the sponsorship that paid for that tangent have been done, the actual topic of trans interest here is an episode within the first season of Penguins of Madagascar, episode 40 to be precise called Misunderstanding, and it's the closest thing to a trans episode that the series gets, so I'm going to eat that shit up and regurgitate it for you like you're my little penguin nestlings. As for where this idea came from, it came specifically from Kian Carlyle themselves, who commented telling me about it after they did that big three hour long rise and fall video on Penguins of Madagascar. So. Thanks for the suggestion, I will in fact be covering this episode, and I hope you enjoy my perspective on it, Kian. With all that said, how about we finally get on with it? So the episode begins with that intro that only existed for those 11 minute cartoons that played in the 2000s on children's networks, if that makes sense. Like it opens with the title of the episode on an image that then fades into all the credits for the people while some very stock music plays. It's as if they saw those old school cartoons from the early 1900s by Disney and then just kept doing that because it was already the perfected way to introduce an audience. Shit, should, should I be doing that in my videos? Huh. One second. But the episode seriously actually begins with the penguins Jay chillin', doing their routine to impress the kids, and pulling it off in a frankly pretty impressive display of talent. While the zookeeper, who has presumably watched this often enough, is bored out of their goddamn mind by these penguins doing the choreography of a highly trained ballet group. Like, I don't know, I think that no matter how often I saw penguins do that, I would probably still come away thinking that it was something worth being impressed by. As they wrap up this routine though, with Skipper telling the boys, and he always calls them the boys, and I'm sure that such a term will not in any way come back in some comedic response to a narrative revelation, that these boys should always leave the kids wanting more, as the zookeeper tells information to those same school kids, with one particularly nerdy kid interjecting a bunch of facts that are clearly pissing off their fellow classmates and will not win them any points in the socializing category. Oh, did you know a group of penguins is called a rookery? Hey, hey, did you know penguins can swim 15 miles an hour? Yeah! <laughs> I always find this kind of rude how shows do this. Like making a kid who info dumps out to be this big old dweeb. And I find it rude because, well, firstly, because kids enjoy regurgitating stuff that they learnt that they think is cool. And we should encourage that kind of adventurous education for them to develop. And secondly, because info dumping as a form of social interaction is a trait that I know all too well. 
because it's exactly how I connected with and continue to connect with people, thanks to the magical powers of autism. This kid's continued exposing of penguin facts catches the attention of Skipper, though, and he orders the penguins to keep an eye on him to figure out where he gets his information from. A continuing joke about the penguins that is based around how they are, like, military slash spy coded for comedy. We then learn that the only way we can find out if a penguin is male or female is by DNA test, as it's almost impossible to figure out otherwise. Which is actually true, but also possibly a build-up to something in the story. I don't know, probably, right? In response to this info, though, Skipper declares that, well, that kid there's off his nut as all these penguins know that they don't need a DNA test to be sure that they are 100% Antarctic macho. Which is a very transgender point. Like, you know, fuck the biological essentialism. If you believe you are what you are, and that's what you want to be, then you are what you are. That's never gonna fit in a shirt. However, the zookeeper then drops a bombshell piece of information on the audience and the penguins by saying that there are three males and one female penguin in this exhibit. And that's all she bloody well knows, alright, you little shit, say? Eh? And that the penguins will know which is which. Listen, kid, all I know is we've got three males and a female. The birds know which is which. Oh. Now, personally, I find this quite fascinating as a dichotomy. The obvious humour that they use between her claim that the penguins know and the fact that these penguins clearly absolutely totally have no idea what the biological gender of each other is and just kind of went along with what everyone was acting like they were. Like, that is intriguing as a concept to display for people. This notion that gender performativity is more valuable for the establishment of the gender of those you know, that whatever is in their pants or their genetics is not something you can know or have 100% info on, and so basing anything on that is kinda silly. But the narrative here is reliant upon these penguins actually caring about this new information, and trying to figure out which one of them is the female penguin, because otherwise there wouldn't be a story to watch or talk about. So the penguins all spit into cups, and Kowalski builds a DNA analyzer to try and figure out who the female amongst them is, who the sussy barker is. Though Skipper initially believes that the very act of spitting into a cup is the test, saying that only men could do something like that. Loogie hockey. That's how a real man gives a DNA sample, am I right? Skipper gives off very mask dad energy here. Like, I'm half expecting him to invite me down pub-like for a pint and to watch the footy with his mates from the old factory. The machine goes through and says that all the penguins are male, much to their joy, until it hits Skipper and reveals that he is the girl, to the shock of the other penguins. And a big old plus sign for me, well, that's that. <laughs> Kowalski tries to cover it up at first, before Skipper muscles past and finds out the truth. The other penguins then have an awkward laugh at him, as his whole knowledge of himself and who he is and his gender gets broken down by this revelation, which is honestly a bit rude. And the reactions across the board here are sort of a microcosm, I think, of how much gender really does mean to people. Like, the security of their gender is a real relief to these penguins, and the denial of it is actively traumatic and horrifying, with Skipper really leaping straight into the five stages of grief as detailed by Kowalski. Wrong infinity! There's no way I'm a female! Alright, what you are experiencing are the five stages of grief. Skipper demands a retrial, though. And so Kowalski takes him through a less-than-rigorous trial to confirm the fact, 
Specifically, Skipper blindfold pinning a pin onto a board with a monster truck and a unicorn on it, which he whiffs, I guess, and puts onto the unicorn. Aha! Madam? Lie! Yeah, maybe Kowalski isn't, like, the best scientist in the world, nor the ideal person to be relying upon for information. And Skipper continues to go through all those stages of anger, grief, bargaining, before landing on acceptance in the span of, like, a minute. Literally, he tells Rico to plant a bow on his head, says, well, that's that, can't control that, but just gotta move on, and gets the troops back in line. Well, I guess you gotta play the hand you're dealt. Let's move out, gentlemen! Kowalski tries to interject and make this into a bigger deal, but Skipper just moves right on through it into the mission at hand. And this is honestly the best possible way that this could be handled initially anyways. Like, Skipper takes all of this in stride, and just shrugs before going about his business like nothing serious happened. Because as far as they're all concerned, basically nothing has changed except for the fact that Skipper has a big pink bow on his head now. Rico, hit me with a pretty pink bow. <laughs> sure, we've moved past that, Kowalski. And I am continuing to use he slash him pronouns for Skipper here, because, well, because that's what he identifies as. And this gender reveal doesn't seem to really change that identity at all. So they go about a semi-montage of their mission, which is predominantly just them fixing up the zoo and, like, doing the basic maintenance that should probably be done by the zookeepers, to be honest. But I guess the penguins might, by doing the maintenance, make the zookeepers think it's not an issue because some invisible force seems to make sure that everything runs smoothly in the background, and those zookeepers just don't question why. But during the course of this semi-montage, we see that the other penguins don't treat Skipper exactly the same anymore, or that Skipper has suddenly started acting in ways that would be determined as more stereotypically feminine according to human standards of that time period. Trust me, the idea of humanising these penguins is something that is very well established in the course of the films and this TV show. They are effectively human, but in like penguin form, for all intents and purposes. Dedicated to help. Help. Dedicated to help. For example, they don't chest bump Skipper anymore. Skipper waits for them to open the door for him, which leads to Private getting dragged away by some rats for who knows what those little freaky guys are gonna do to him. Or Skipper desperately needing to pee while the penguins are in a car and the other penguins don't know where the ladies' toilet is. Hang in there, Skipper. I I'm sure the zoo must have a ladies' room somewhere. I just never really paid attention before. It's all stuff that makes Skipper go to camera and the audience directly with the question of what is happening to him? What is happening to me? To which the obvious answer is that subconsciously he is expressing himself in more feminine ways, or ways that he would view to be feminine based on recreations of female identity in mainstream media and society, even if he openly might have said that this changes nothing at all. Now, that's the complex and sociological answer to this question, which I fear that Penguins of Madagascar might not treat with the due reverence that the six remaining minutes of the episode afford us. I guess what I'm scared of here is that this gender swapping might get really sexist really fast, and not afford itself a message at the end that combats that established sexism. That's my fears of the episode anyways. But the facts of the episode is that it continues to show us stuff like King Julian, the Lima leader and his servants. Wait, hang on. King Julian is here in this zoo? I thought King Julian was on the Madagascar island. Bye-bye. See you later, crocodile. Maurice, my arm is tired. Wave it for me. What? 
what happened between this show starting and the first movie ending, where all the lemurs ended up in the New York City Zoo? Regardless, King Julian is mad, because he wants to know why this penguin all of a sudden is wearing a pretty pink bow. And also, why doesn't he get to wear a pretty pink bow? Where's his damn bow? Why is that penguin wearing a pretty pink bow on his head and shouting at the sky spirits? How come I do not have a pretty pink bow? King Julian is kind of a genderqueer or gender fucky character, in the sense that he identifies as male, but doesn't let that stop him from dressing or acting however he damn well pleases. It might also have something to do with the protections afforded to royalty by virtue of their status from the normal societal pressures that crush people into boxes. I'm just spitballing this point, to be honest. The penguins come back in a new scene, where Skipper is telling the rest of the group that in fact this new information that they've learned will mean that he can no longer exist in the unit. That being a woman means he can't work with the guys, or be a military slash spy whatever the penguins are. Which is certainly some Jordan Peterson-esque sexism that seems about right for what I was worried was going to occur. Do you think men and women can work in the workplace together? I don't know. Like, what? Here's a rule. Don't, don't How about no makeup in the workplace? Uh, Isn't that sexually provocative? I don't know why. Why do you make your lips red? Because they turn red during sexual arousal. And Kowalski, Private, and Rico all agree that this is an untenable situation, and that he's making the right call. I don't like the message here that men and women can't work together, and. That's sort of all I've got to say about this for now. Skipper decides that he slash she is going to go on an epic quest to discover their femininity and grow from a confused young girl into a real woman. Which makes me think that at this point Skipper is going full hog into the whole being a woman thing rather than treating it as having no effect on them, which kinda demeans that whole joy that I had around the fact that the gender initially was tret as if it changed nothing, because now it has been tret like it is a big deal that changes everything. But for this moment, I will update my terms accordingly to the fact that Skipper is at least identifying as a woman for this moment. So we'll go with she, her for now, at least until it changes again, Probably in the episode. Skipper then goes to the only woman that she knows that would be of aid, I suppose. The zoo's otter, Marlene. And that isn't actually a joke. There is a real lack of female characters in this show, so this is one of the few women that gets regularly featured. Marlene is confused by this whole thing because Skipper just dropped in on her and told her to take Skipper through the whole life cycle of what Skipper assumes the average girl goes through. And the show has Marlene be our voice of reason, and the good moral of the story presenter, emphasised by the good moral of the story music that plays while she tells Skipper that if Skipper is a girl, then whatever she enjoys doing is girl stuff, that by the pure virtue of the fact that she is into it, it becomes that. Skipper, if you're a girl, then girl stuff is well, whatever you like doing. If you're into the commando thing, being a girl doesn't change that. Now, that's the feminist message that I was hoping for here, and it's nice to see that Skipper has one friend who is willing to explain this to her, and not just push her into the stereotypes that she is attempting to embody based on a very outside view of her own femininity. Skipper, unfortunately, is still dealing with the overwhelming power of toxic internalised masculinity. That means she acknowledges that girls can do spy stuff, but they can't be good at spy stuff. And that when danger happens, the girl should just stay hidden and gossip about boys instead. To which Marlene slams her into the ground and drags her outside to go and confront that scary noise. Hey, that's no way to treat a lady. Sometimes you do gotta take the extreme violent option to help somebody break out of that conditioning. And what I would suspect is gonna happen here is that this episode is going the classic gender swap route. 
wherein the purpose of it is to give guys in the audience a view on femininity from the perspective of a character who was a guy and is now a woman, so that those children in the audience can empathise with the struggles of perceptions that women deal with. It's a useful tool in children's shows, and one that I've covered before in Boy Meets World and Fairly Odd Parents. Ah, uh, name dropping myself on my own shows. Classic me there. The dangerous noises that are heard are the lemurs, who have messed with the electrical wiring of the zoo and are now getting vicious by live electrical wires. 5,000 volts of pure, dangerous power. 5,000 volts of sheer mortal danger. <laughs> to which Marlene tells Skipper that only one person here can do anything about it and save those lemurs, girlfriend. However, the boys then turn up and Skipper immediately goes, well, they can handle it while the ladies over here go and make pink lemonade for them when they succeed. Because sexism lives in all of us, even women. And it's our job to constantly be examining our behaviours and actions to see how we might be replicating the same harmful attitudes that would put down other women. It takes everybody to beat bigotry. Never forget that. However, while Skipper is having a revelation moment about the fact that maybe Marlene is right and that a team needs a leader, a Skipper if you will, <laughs> But wait, what if Marlene's angry face is right? Team needs a skipper. Maybe. The boys succeed in getting trapped by the electrical wires and are also now in danger of being killed too. So Skipper has to rush through the feminine power awakening and proceed to rescue all the guys with that same pretty pink bow that she requested earlier. To the amazement of those guys, as she does cool commando whip stuff, and also like some dancing with the silk cloth too in between. I was going to name drop what this was, but I could not for the life of me remember. It's not ballet, and it's not aerial silk dancing, and no matter what I typed in, I could not find the name for it at all. Skipper wrangles up all those cables, and gets a girl power moment with Marlene to celebrate this badass shit while the boy penguins apologise for earlier, and say this line in particular. Quite know how to say this, but, uh, well, even as a female, you're still the machoest manly man I know. I don't know how to read the gender politics of that one. It's all kinds of fucked up, to be honest, all things considered, but the sentiment is in the right place, even if the words maybe are not. However, we discover that the power issues were caused by a blown fuse, because the machine that Kowalski built was a huge power hog that the zoo systems were not prepared for, and so it had stopped working midway through its DNA analysis, and upon fixing it, it gives Skipper a plus sign, and it turns out that he is totally male after all. To the celebration and cheers of the other penguins, who I guess have learned nothing about this experience that would tell them that cheering for someone being a guy is just as detrimentally sexist as being upset to find out that someone is a girl. I'm a real boy after all. Yes. <laughs> Skipper then delivers the moral of the story, which is that no matter what gender you are, the only thing that truly matters is this. Boy, girl, all that really matters is how well you use a pink bull whip in a crisis situation. And I guess I could sort of agree with that one, at least for the fact that it is true for this situation they dealt with in today's episode. Mayhaps as a moral, it ignores the wider ramifications and ideas at play, but it's maybe a start. Or maybe that's just as far as the feminism for these penguins will go. Kowalski is confused by how Alice, the zookeeper from the beginning, could have been so wrong about there being three male and one female penguins. To which Skipper says that it's fine. Ah, she's a man. Everyone knows they're all morons. What? We'll work on that one. And that's the episode. Now, 
I've covered most of my opinions as we went along, so hopefully if you paid attention, you sort of got where I was going with my conclusion here. But to summarise it all up, this is a bit of a mixed bag as far as Geniswap episodes go. There is a lot of sexism in play here about not just women but also guys too, and feminine stereotypes that the show does at the end with the character Marlene attempt to debunk and to work towards providing a message that is positive of femininity and encourages boys in the audience to consider women as their equals, but Marlene within the show kind of gets ignored by the penguins or trampled over in the way that those penguins reach their own often incomplete or wrong conclusions. Ooh, wait, see, I don't think that was really the lesson. I... We don't really see a commitment from Skipper towards any feminine stuff that they might like or enjoy that he will keep doing. Instead, the whole focus is really on what Skipper loses, and the reassurance that being a woman doesn't mean you have to lose being a macho, masculine man. A message that I agree with, but I would have liked for the Penguins to get to explore femininity in a way that encourages it for boys in the audience, that tells them it is okay to be interested in or engage with feminine stuff, not to be upset or annoyed or hide it if they do, out of fear of the disappointment of other men. That was something that Fairly Odd Parents really used as a strong theme in its gender swap episode, and it's something that I really liked. There's plenty of action on this show. We'll be back with more of the Kissy Kissy Goo Goo Romance Hour right after this! Penguins has a more distinct message than the Sweet Life one. There is a more clear narrative being told here that is trying to portray some kind of good lesson for the children watching but it doesn't quite nail the landing as well as it could. And in regards to the trans community watching this one, I would say that there are some elements here that could tie into a trans awakening, but it's not the most clear piece of trans community nostalgia that I have dived into. I think mayhaps some people could get something out of the way in which Skipper's gender identity and gender expression really do seem to fight each other, as the stereotypes that he is told to embody battle with what he likes to do and enjoys existing as. The almost enforced way in which he pushes himself to engage with all things considered feminine while in his heart, it's clear that he does still want to be the organised leader of a spy unit. Something he views as a masculine exploit and therefore that he can't possibly do as a woman. And that's sort of explored and resolved as a theme before the additional revelation that resets the universe to the next episode. They kind of tie up the fact that he can do that before they go, well actually he's also not a woman anyway. And that kind of works into our second comment. It's never clear that Kowalski's machines are definitive or correct. Sometimes they do work, and sometimes they're just perceived as working. But maybe the scientist whose backup science plan was to have someone pin a pin on a board with a monster truck and a unicorn is not the reliable font of information that the penguins might believe Kowalski to be. Kowalski, where does this aircraft go? From the odd shape of this bagel, I'd say we're headed for Paris. What I am getting at here is that Alice the Zookeeper might be totally right. One of these penguins might be biologically female, and just because the machine told them all that they are male, it doesn't change that fact. But it's not going to matter, and they are just not going to question or care about it ever again in this story. Which is sort of interesting because it's never brought up again. Like, all four of these penguins willfully ignore the fact that one of them might be a girl, because as far as they're concerned, they're all male and want to be male, and that is how they're going to continue to express themselves and exist as for the rest of the franchise. Looks like we're back in business, boys. And our business is saving penguin kind. It's sort of accidentally, awkwardly, 
trans mask in a very roundabout and not intentional manner whatsoever. But I can see some people getting reassured by that ignorance of biology. Because to the penguins, it doesn't matter to them. They can't tell what biological sex each other is anyway, so, I mean, who gives a shit? Which maybe is a lesson that we should take on board too. That no matter what someone might appear as or express themselves as, we have no idea what is going on in their DNA or background, and that maybe it doesn't matter. And we should just accept that what they tell us they are is what we should treat them as. I mean, this representation of penguins is reflective of reality. Where in a lot of times recently, zoos have just treat penguins as whatever gender. Because it's a lot of effort to figure it out, and they all basically act the same, and look the same, and so many penguin couples end up being the same sex because of that fact that it doesn't seem to matter to those penguins and they can't tell. We could learn a lot from the penguins, really, now that I think about it. Did I just convince myself around to saying that Penguins of Madagascar is an accidental trans masterpiece? No, I don't think so. But I can see why people would be able to think that. Anyway, thanks for watching the video. And if you enjoyed what you saw here, then you can like, share, subscribe, comment, or go and support penguins yourself by using one of those sites that allows you to adopt wild ones and pay to care for them. I'll put a link to description below that you can go and if you want to go and do that. They're getting severely messed up by environmental changes, pollution, and overfishing, and it's our duty to clean up our own messes and help those species whose time on this planet we're kind of doing our best to ruin and shorten. If you really enjoy what I have done here, then you can support me on Patreon, Ko-Fi, or here on YouTube as a member. The names of those in the $5 and up category should be scrolling past the screen right now. And I really appreciate everyone who does subscribe there, because it lets me continue doing these videos with more financial security than YouTube can provide. An especially tenuous thing when videos can get easily mass reported for featuring trans stuff, and then the bloody robots just demonetize it, and I can't even get them to change it because it's all just robots all the way down, who refuse to actually listen to my concerns and just respond with automated shit. Yes, I have a recent experience with this, and it was incredibly painful. So if you want to see me get paid for my work in a substantial manner, the best way to do that is via Patreon. And I am sure I'm going to end up making a Patreon video at some point, espousing the advantages of people subscribing to it in a more clear sense, like maybe I'll make a Discord so people can go on there and like give me like direct suggestions and stuff. Probably after the South Park video next month, honestly. Anyways. Thank you again for your time. I hope you learnt something from this video or enjoyed yourself, and remember to have a great day.